The Discovery Channel and the Chrysler Corporation are proud to bring you the best in quality documentary television. This presentation of The Brain is presented in partnership with Chrysler Plymouth and Jeep Eagle, divisions of the Chrysler Corporation. Where do we store our memories? Does a particular nook or corner in our brains keep our treasured past safe so we can retrieve pieces of it when needed, the way we recover something from a basement room or a dusty attic? Well, not exactly. The brain simply doesn't have room to store everything we encounter in life. Instead, memories get broken up into bits and pieces and according to a peculiar housekeeping system, are dispersed among the rooms, closets, and hallways of the brain. How we get the pieces to fit back together to produce memory is one of the great mysteries, something brain biologists are trying to solve under the microscope. Go ahead, take a look at what's really going on inside your brain. As you watch this program, billions of cells in your brain are exchanging electrical and chemical pulses at an astonishing speed. Chemicals in the brain, neurotransmitters, send signals through a vast network of nerve cells, or neurons. These chemicals control the way we learn things and store them for future reference. This process is the beginning of memory. At Washington University in St. Louis, researchers are using a PET scan machine to map the course of memory in the brain as we store information. In this experiment, a subject memorizes a list of words, then scientists show her only the first three letters of the same words. By asking her to recall the full word, they can see what parts of the brain she uses for remembering. White. The researchers found a high rate of activity in the depths of the brain, in a place called the hippocampus. The name is Latin for seahorse, which it resembles in shape.
In the hippocampus, rows of about 40 million nerve cells are lined up. These cells help store information from our senses into memory. For example, when we memorize someone's face, we break it down to simple shapes. Bits of information about these shapes go to the hippocampus. The hippocampus forms part of the brain's limbic system. Among its roles, the limbic system also gives us our emotions. The hippocampus processes and evaluates, and then waits for further information from the senses and the rest of the limbic system to see if the face should be filed away in the memory. Here, with this computer-enhanced PET scan, you can see the brain at work. New information runs instantaneously through the hippocampus. If the hippocampus, or even the pathway to it, is damaged, our ability to make new memories is destroyed. High technology offers one way of understanding how memory works in the brain. Human tragedy, another. In England, one man takes us into his eerie world, where memory has lost its place and meaning. To the unwitting eye, Jeremy Cuss might pass for any average, intelligent young man. A closer look reveals a devastated life. Jeremy dictates every moment of his day into a micro tape recorder. Without it, he would have no idea of what happened an hour ago, even a few minutes ago. Jeremy has no short-term memory. A brain injury several years ago damaged an area near his hippocampus. He can remember some of his past before his injury. His long-term memories stored away from the hippocampus are intact. He simply cannot lay down new ones. He cannot add to his past. He won't remember this race. Jeremy, who's 27, lives alone. To keep his independence, he's had to adopt a disciplined routine of daily record keeping. Um, hang on a second. What am I doing? Lettuce. No, that's for the rice. If he doesn't write down what he made the day before, Jeremy cooks the same meal twice. He needs to take note of what he eats. He was a nice chap. He was, he, he was a muscle man. Because Jeremy's long-term memories were spared, so was his sense of self. He knows who he is. He knows the people at this meal. They are old friends, and he remembers them. Let me insult you, Mr. Button taught me to drive. Did he? Oh, that's how you got to know. That's how you got to know this one. This was once Jeremy's life, a scholar and an athlete at prestigious Cambridge University in England. He rode for the crew team and plan to practice law. His life changed forever when he lost his short-term memory. Now, he lives a moment-to-moment -moment existence. How did you feel? I think there was a, certain, there was a lot of bitterness and a lot of anger. 
Yeah, a lot of say it again. I think there's a lot of bitterness that I couldn't be a lawyer. Um, worry about what else I was going to do in the future. Talking with Julie. What was the last question you asked me? What were the feelings of... Jeremy's future plans fell apart one afternoon in his professor's office. While he was being tutored, Jeremy suddenly went into convulsions. He collapsed on the floor, unconscious. A blood vessel had burst in Jeremy's brain. Severe bleeding damaged the pathway into the hippocampus. A tape recorder now must do what his damaged brain cannot. Every phone conversation is recorded. Later, Jeremy transcribes them into his notebook. Jeremy keeps meticulous notes on his friends, their likes and dislikes, and conversations they've had. He lives by the clock. An alarm tells him when it's time to go and where. Jeremy's case, and others like it, led researchers to conclude that the brain stores different types of memory in different places. Jeremy's long-term memory allows him to travel unescorted to his mother's house. He made this trip often, but without short-term memory, he may suddenly forget where he is going. How is it that Jeremy can remember the old, but not the new? Researchers say the answer is in the hippocampus. Deep inside the temporal lobe, the hippocampus is a layover depot for bundles of new information. A package of material could be delayed here for hours, days, even years before moving on to permanent storage. To understand how, we need to take a closer look at the way the brain's nerve cells work. Here's what happens first. In the brain and throughout the nervous system, special neurons convert what we see, smell, hear and touch into electrical signals. These signals travel the long, wiry fibers between brain cells. The fibers are the communications network of the nervous system. At the tip of each fiber are round sacs containing chemicals called neurotransmitters. The sacs rest on one side of a tiny gap, 50,000 times smaller than a millimeter. Called the synapse, it separates one neuron from the next. The neurotransmitters are the way the cells communicate across this gap. Here are two neurons forming a synapse between their branches. If you look closely at the end of the top neuron, you'll see the actual neurotransmitter sacs. On the opposite side of the synapse are rows of receptors these are the targets for the neurotransmitters. 
When the electric signal in one neuron reaches the end of its line, it zaps the chemical sacs into action. The zapped sacs rupture and bombard the neighboring neuron with their molecules. The molecules fit into tulip-like receptors on the neighboring neuron. Then the receptors open up and let in charged particles called ions. These ions start up a weak new electrical current in the receiving neuron. In the hippocampus, according to a leading theory, successive bombardments of neurotransmitters strengthen this weak signal. The repeated stimulation opens up this receptor, which lets in a rush of calcium ions. The calcium ions activate enzymes like this one, shown in purple. The activated enzyme moves around the cell, setting off a chain of reactions mediated by other enzymes. The enzymes behave like a special construction team, changing the structure of the receptors. These altered receptors seem to ease the passage of electric currents across the synapse. Before, these receptors would only allow the passage of weak currents. Now, they can convey strong signals. This change, called long-term potentiation, lasts for several weeks. Researchers think these strengthened connections in the hippocampus are newly created memories. Eventually, the memory needs to be moved into permanent storage. When the hippocampus is done consolidating information, it ships the package onto the cortex, the thin outer layer of the brain. Thoughts and experiences destined to become long-term memories travel to the cortex via electrical signals. Memories aren't stored intact. Instead, they're broken down into pieces and distributed throughout the cortex. The shape, color, and smell of an apple are categorized and filed away in different networks of neurons. The cortex is home to about two-thirds of all the brain cells and the intricate circuits they create number in the trillions. Activating just a few of them can set off a chain of communication that brings back together all our vivid recollections of an apple. But exactly how this process works is still stumping researchers, though some have interesting theories. Dr. Daniel Alcon is one of the directors of memory research at the National Institutes of Health. When you remember your father's face, you're really remembering the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the eyebrows, the forehead and hair, all in relation or association to each other. So for example, the image of your father's face, the visual image is related to the auditory image of the sound of his name, to the um, emotional image that you have, and to the visual image that you would have of the word, and even of the image of the motion that you make to say those words. If you remember a small set, a small piece of all of those relationships, you can bring back all the rest of the relationships. An example you could think of it is like you have a chain of many, many links. If you can get a critical number of the links to grab onto, you can pull the rest of those links, the whole chain, into your consciousness. <laughs> Had Jeremy lost his long-term memories too, he would have resembled someone with advanced Alzheimer's disease.
But Jeremy's amnesia did not strip him of his mind or personality. With the right tools and support, he can cope. His memories, immediate memories, before he was taken ill, were painful ones. I had to repair them. I had to work on it. Six ounces of sugar. Can you tell that Uncle Jeremy's made these before? Can you tell? And Granny always had to be very careful that Uncle Jeremy, that Uncle Jeremy didn't burn his fingers when he was a little boy and helping Mummy to make them. Oh, do you know when I did burn myself? No. Yes. When? No, I, was, I think I was at home one day. Um, when did you? Well, I think you were out. And I was just, a, just about the age when I was allowed to be at, I was allowed to be at home on my own. Yes. And so you were out, and I was making hot orange before I went to bed. Yes. And I put the kettle on, and I was then stretching up to the cupboard to get the sun quick orange down. Yes. And the boiling water went on my stomach. Oh. And so I, then, I don't remember no. that. That's good. That's I, I then, good. If you talk to Evie, I phoned mm. Evie up and I was squealing down the phone. Yes. And Evie dashed down. And I remember. Yay, I good. remember. Good for you. Good for you. Good for you. And while amnesiacs like Jeremy can't recall specific facts such as faces, names, or places, they can learn certain kinds of skills, such as playing the piano or driving a car. The skill becomes automatic like riding a bike, something that's never forgotten. The difference, though, is that while we may remember the time we first learned to ride a bike, amnesiacs don't. They can perform a task, but have no memory of ever learning how to do it. Jeremy can still learn certain skills which get stored into memory without the help of the hippocampus. Skill memory calls on other parts of the brain, including the cerebellum. The former honor student must now use the learning ability he has left to pursue a career using his hands. Jeremy's training to be a furniture craftsman. I think one of the hardest things I've had to deal with is changing my own self-image from seeing myself as a confident young lawyer to becoming something completely and utterly different to taking a career that I would never have thought of before I was ill. At night he writes to seize his day. then safely stores it away in notebooks, recording his thoughts, activities, and emotions. For now, Jeremy keeps his memory in a box behind the couch. The journals tie his days together to give him continuity in a world of fleeting moments. All of us experience some memory loss as we age and as brain cells naturally die off.
cells die because the brain's blood vessels, the tiny lifelines that carry oxygen and fuel, get worse at their jobs as we get older. These capillaries run deep into the brain to nourish the nerve cells with oxygen-rich blood. Over time, the diameter of a blood vessel shrinks, reducing the flow of blood cells. Once the supply of oxygen and nutrients gets blocked, the nerve cells die one by one. Casualties run high in the crucial hippocampus area. We can't produce new neurons. What we lose, we lose for good. But losing brain cells need not make our minds feeble. We have 100 billion nerve cells at birth. Even if we lose 20%, as most of us eventually do, we may experience no more than mild forgetfulness. Though brain cells are important, the connections they make are even more so. These rich connections can help an 80-year-old outthink a high school student. Even though neurons naturally die, the brain continues to form new connections to fill the gaps. Some researchers believe a stimulating learning environment can foster rich neural networks. So age by itself does not mean dementia. Instead, dementia is a product of disease. More often than not, the disease is Alzheimer's. For much of human history, Alzheimer's ravaged the mind in relative obscurity. But in this house, nearly a hundred years ago, a German doctor began the effort to understand this dreaded condition. Dr. Alois Alzheimer, a psychiatrist, grew perplexed over a patient who experienced memory loss, paranoia, and hallucinations before dying at age 56. Alzheimer dissected her brain. Looking through his microscope, he found signs of the disease that would be named for him. In his journal, he described how the patient's brain was riddled with strange tangles of diseased neurons. The tangles had spread like cobwebs throughout the cortex. The role these tangles play in the disease eluded Dr. Alzheimer, as they do scientists today. What actually happens in the brain of an Alzheimer's victim? What causes the brain cells to die off so rapidly? Alzheimer's makes an unassuming entrance. Minor forgetfulness, apathy, or restlessness can start as early as age 35, though in most cases, symptoms appear after age 65. Joining the battle against Alzheimer's are these improbable foes the school sisters of the Order of Notre Dame. They have decided to donate their brains for science. Fewer of them get the disease than the rest of the general population, and those who do don't seem to suffer its most devastating effects. Many of the sisters live past 90, and yet they have an unusually low incidence of Alzheimer's. 
Dr. David Snowden at the University of Kentucky wants to know their secret. We're very interested in what causes Alzheimer's, but we're also equally interested in, in what's possible. How long can you live with intact mental and physical function? I mean, I think if the gold standards for aging exist, uh, they exist in, in places like uh, the, this convent. There's something to pray about, some terrible tragedy to see. That's a primary hypothesis of our study, is that by developing your brain as much as you possibly can in your mind early on in life and maintaining it at a high level uh, of activity throughout your life, that when you start to have problems when you're 80 or 90, you may be slower to show the behavioral problems of Alzheimer's. And there's every reason to believe that the way you think uh, the types of things you think about, the complexity of your thoughts, uh, the, the stimulation that you give to your brain may have a huge impact on whether you get Alzheimer's or not, as well as, probably more importantly, the quality of your life later on. Four, she's burned at the stake. That's Joan Please. of Arc. Uh, who is Joan of Arc? You are right. Uh, she published for 400. Now, whether playing cards and doing word puzzles and reading will help the brain cells branch and sprout, we don't know that for sure. But if the brain is anything like the bones or the muscles, we know that it's use it or lose it. When you get a plaque or tangle, one of the first things that your brain cells do is that they try to branch around that lesion to get around it. And we think that these connections between brain cells will improve the chances that these lesions will not cause you behavioral problems and that other parts of your brain have a better chance of taking over the functions if they're very, very well connected. By comparing brain tissue from people of the same age, you can see the density of neurons is remarkably reduced in Alzheimer's. On the left, a normal cell count. On the right, an Alzheimer's count. The gaping holes and recesses show where the disease has eaten away the tissue. This brain weighs only one pound, one-third of a normal brain. We can't make a definite diagnosis of Alzheimer's for our studies without looking at the brain tissue at death. And so asking the sisters to donate their brain at death was, was a real key in, ingredient for us doing good research on Alzheimer's. This is a very, very, very personal thing we're asking that the personality is encoded in the brain, the ability to touch, to communicate, to love is encoded in the brain, and that's what makes it such a personal organ. But on the other hand, that's what makes Alzheimer's such a terrible disease, is it damages our humanness. So I think that when they put it in that perspective, that they were willing to do it. I know. They used to tell me that. I loved it. You had girls? Well, I was I had to. I had double. Part of what the sisters, uh, the historic information that we're using are autobiographies the sisters wrote, all written the turn of the century, when these women were 20, just a few weeks before they took their vows and formally became sisters. And we were very struck with the contrast in, in the writing styles. I was born in the busy metropolis of New York on a bright and sunny spring morning of April 23rd, 1906. At the age of six, I was led by my mother to Holy Redeemer School on 3rd Street, New York. So if you've got a great memory and can write complex sentences with lots of ideas in them when you're a child, that means that maybe later on when you're 90, when you start to get the lesions of Alzheimer's, that you may you may be slower to show the behavioral problems of Alzheimer's because you've got a lot of memory reserve or brain reserve, so you can lose a little bit. I do remember it, yeah. That's beautiful. I mean, I remember what I did this morning, but I... <laughs> Alzheimer's is a degenerative disease. As sections of the brain deteriorate, so do the patient's abilities. First, 
the number of neurons in the hippocampus drops dramatically. The ability to form new memory wanes. When cell deterioration spreads to the temporal and frontal lobes, judgment and thinking suffer, as does long-term memory. When the disease spreads to the parietal lobe, the ability to do routine tasks, like using a fork or tying a shoe, may sometimes disappear. Computer-enhanced images show the areas where brain activity shuts down. In this patient, only the areas in red and yellow show any signs of life. On the left, the activity level of a healthy brain. New findings suggest there may be several factors contributing to Alzheimer's. Most of the symptoms result from low levels of a brain chemical called acetylcholine, or ACH, a neurotransmitter critical to memory and learning. When neurons die, ACH production goes down, and the brain's crucial communication lines are cut. But what kills the nerve cells in the first place? Evidence suggests that proteins found in the brains of Alzheimer's victims may, in fact, signal the body's immune system to attack itself. The largest clue by far has been this plaque, or dark spot. It consists mainly of a sticky protein fragment called beta amyloid. Though we all have beta amyloid in our bodies, large accumulations of the protein in the brain are characteristic of Alzheimer's. In his lab at NIH, Dr. Elkon wants to find out what role, if any, beta amyloid played in the destruction of brain cells. He's studying potassium, one of the crucial ions that initiate electrical impulses at the synapse. Well, we took healthy cells and added just a small level of beta amyloid. And we found with that lo very low level of beta amyloid, we could pick out that channel, that potassium channel that was picked out by Alzheimer's disease and make it abnormal in the same way that Alzheimer's disease made it abnormal. So we were in, a, in effect creating the picture of Alzheimer's disease in a normal cell by using just a, a, a smidgen of beta amyloid. That suggests to us that this may actually be part of a disease process. That at some step along the way, even before the beta amyloid is built up into these plaques, it's participating in the disease process and um, making normal memory function, for example, go awry. No fewer than four faulty genes have been implicated in the accumulation of beta amyloid. Any one of them could be a culprit in Alzheimer's disease. I mean, unfortunately, it's not going to be like, yes, it's aluminum, or yes, it's mercury, or whatever. It's, it's likely to be a very, very multi-causal disease. It's probably a little bit of genes, a little bit of your diet, a little bit of your social history will play a role in whether you get, Alz whether you get Alzheimer's or not. Dr. Alcon and his colleagues are working on a simple skin test for diagnosing Alzheimer's in its early stages. Well, we developed the test for Alzheimer's disease with a, 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 a hypothesis about how it's working. 
that it, the disease is not just affecting brain cells, but it's affecting many cells in the body. So for example, we looked at skin cells, we looked at sensory cells in the nose, and what we found was that certain particular channels were absolutely missing. They weren't functioning in Alzheimer's patients. This suggested that we might actually have a basis for a laboratory diagnosis. Diagnosis in Alzheimer's clinics today is 80 to 90 percent accurate, but it requires numerous visits over a long period of time. A new test could prove a promising tool. The more the cell responds, the more we know its potassium channels are functioning normally. And over a period of time, this will build up into a more intense color. These then are the hallmarks of a normal response, which tells us this individual uh, does not have Alzheimer's disease. This is the kind of response that you would see um, if you were testing the cells of an Alzheimer's patient. They start off blue, indicating no function of potassium channels, and for all practical purposes, they remain blue. Early diagnosis would mean that researchers could shift their focus and find ways to delay or even block the disease before the damage is done. Doctors may soon have a number of different treatments to offer Alzheimer's patients, depending on the diagnosis. If the brain suffers from an immune system malfunction, anti-inflammatory drugs may help. A drug called indomethacin is now being tested. Estrogen is another possible therapy. Estrogen levels in postmenopausal women drop drastically. Recent research suggests that this drop in estrogen may affect mental functions. Estrogen seems to promote production of that crucial memory chemical in the brain, acetylcholine, ACH. If estrogen levels drop, ACH levels may also fall. When the brain has normal levels of ACH, shown here in red, an electrochemical signal is carried across the synapse and continued on the other side. If ACH levels drop, not enough molecules bind to receptors on the next neuron, and the signal isn't renewed. A recent California study found that postmenopausal women taking estrogen supplements had a lower incidence of Alzheimer's. But we don't know yet how effective or how safe estrogen might be in treating Alzheimer's. Other new therapies offer hope for women and men. Pharmaceutical companies are looking at several ways to boost the brain's production of the memory chemical ACH. One drug, THA or Tacrin, paralyzes the enzymes that destroy ACH. THA is the only drug approved by the FDA specifically for the treatment of Alzheimer's. For some Alzheimer's patients, THA seems to produce effective, though temporary, results. It's not a cure. Almost all of us are going to have some disability in our lives, some days where we're confined to a bed, months, maybe years, and some people decades. So I think it's an inevitable thing. Maybe the key more is not to try to prevent this inevitable thing from happening, but try to postpone the disease and disability to very, very late in life. The specter of Alzheimer's makes young and old alike eager to protect the brain and open the locks on memory. My mother suffered for four years from the disease before she died. Now, some young people are actually using themselves as informal test subjects in places like this. It's called a smart bar, a 21st century fountain of youth. Just the latest stop in our eternal search for immortality and genius. The bar serves drinks laced with vitamins and amino acids, 
that promise to enhance learning and memory, a kind of highbrow high. Known as nootropics, a Greek phrase for acting on the mind, smart drinks have yet to penetrate the minds of skeptics. These smart shakes and cocktails still await the rigors of scientific testing. In fact, they can't be legally advertised as IQ boosters, though nootropics are themselves legal, having earned an FDA OK. At smart bars, concoctions like the supersonic cybertonic and memory fuel are regular happy hour items. They're chock full of ingredients called choline, phenylalanine, and synergistic cofactors. Advocates say smart drinks, despite their name, weren't designed to help out your IQ. The, the intelligent quotient is not really what you're going for here. What you're going for is an expansion of the mind, being able to do more, to think more clearly, to generate ideas, to get through long days, and to kind of live in a society where you have information overload, where you have to be able to retain and assimilate information at a rapid pace. For the uninitiated, bartender Curtis Hovey offers his suggestions. This drink contains phenylalanine. It's used in the production of noradrenaline and several other neurotransmitters. It's used by the body for basic thinking, such things as memory recall. This drink I've set up in here contains choline. <clears throat> choline is used in the production of acetylcholine. It's a neurotransmitter used specifically for the formation of memories. You don't need a lot of this, but you need enough in your daily diet. So far, no one's overdosed. They're very safe, that I do know, more than other drugs. Um, they're usually minor reactions, a niacin reaction, for instance, which is a flush of the skin. You feel red, you itch. Um, that's from niacinamide that's in many of the drinks and with choline. Smart drinks are a spin-off of their more scientific counterpart, smart drugs, which you can only get from your doctor. We don't know yet if smart drugs improve the lives of patients who suffer from dementia. The Food and Drug Administration is still trying to determine what effects they do achieve. For now then, drinks like Quantum Punch and Head Popper will have to do. And I'm picking up the flavor with blueberry, my favorite. For so long, the secrets of memory were beyond scientific grasp, always eluding the most diligent researchers. But now we seem to be getting somewhere. Anyway, I have a better understanding of why it is I can recall the name of my first grade teacher, but I can't remember where I parked my car. Short-term memory sits in a holding tank called the hippocampus. That's where the location of my car was parked until distraction bumped it out, before it could be moved to a safer place, like the cortex, which houses long-term memory and the names of my grade school teachers. Maybe this smart drink will help to get me home. But if we really want to find out how the neural webs in the brain pull together the pieces of my past, or forget them completely, science may offer more lasting insights. Researchers are now mapping these neural webs as they splinter, loop, and connect in incredible ways. We're just beginning our search for memory. Oh, I'm David Suzuki, now in search of my car for the Discovery Channel. On the next episode, a husband helps his wife retrain her brain after a stroke. Epileptics gain a new lease on life through brain surgery. And Mother Nature has a way of her own to repair the damage. Children have remarkable abilities to compensate and regain mental function. Inside the neural networks, an incredible reconstruction process can literally rewire a damaged brain. How does the brain grow? 
Why can brain cells change their roles? And why are our brains so plastic? Find out on The Miraculous Mind, the next episode of The Brain, Our Universe Within. its evolutionary armor, the human brain is still a fragile organ. Our skull provides the first line of defense against physical injury. On the inside, sheets of membrane covering the brain keep out invading germs and toxins. But even these safety barriers can't stave off all injury. They're no match against head-on collision or the missile force of a bullet. In fact, Traumatic brain injury is the number one killer of people under 34. There's a saying used by doctors, touch the brain, never the same. When injury, stroke, or disease touch the brain, lives change profoundly. But some of these lives tell stories of quiet victories, of miracles, both great and small. And these tales also open a window to the remarkable capacities of the brain, its power to repair and restore itself, a power we're just beginning to discover and understand. In Japan, diaries, a thousand pages long, are one man's efforts to make sense of the stroke that changed his married life. Nine years ago, my wife collapsed with a stroke. Her heart stopped for a few minutes, and she was almost brain dead. She was in a coma for two months. At the time, our children were grown, and I had just retired from my job. We were looking forward to spending our retirement together. The stroke occurred just as we were beginning our new life. What I find mysterious about my wife's illness is that, after all these years, she has become almost a daughter to me, a child who is still growing. How much will she recover? What am I supposed to do? Here, in Hanamaki, husband and wife spend their days at the city hospital. For Kentaro Sasaki and his wife Toshiko, their shattered lives called on new measures of courage and forbearance. At the time of her stroke, Toshiko's doctors thought she was on the verge of brain death. Her recovery has been painstakingly slow. But today, another triumph. Toshiko is learning to count again. <laughs> Throughout the years since Toshiko's illness, her husband has been at her side. It is he who now attends to her daily needs preparing meals and helping to feed and bathe her. Toshko cannot walk. The stroke damaged a certain area of her brain that left her right side paralyzed.
even the simplest tasks are now exhausting. Though it's the king of the nervous system, the human brain is also extremely delicate. To work properly, it requires lots of blood, more than any other part of the body. An intricate network of blood vessels carries oxygen and other essential nutrients to the brain. During a stroke, these lifelines are cut. When blood flow stops, it takes only a few minutes for critical nerve cells or neurons to die. Unlike other cells in the body, neurons don't regenerate. Once they die, they're gone forever. This is an MRI scan of Toshko's injured brain. Most of the left side was destroyed when the blood vessels that fed that area were blocked. New imaging techniques provide a three-dimensional view and show in vivid detail the extent of damage. A stroke does more than destroy tissue. It shuts down large areas of the brain's communications networks. These networks consist of neurons that exchange information using bursts of electricity. When a blood clot destroys a neuron, it also cuts off the neuron's ability to talk to other cells. If the information lines are severed, we may lose the ability to perform important functions such as talking or walking. But the brain, as it turns out, is still resilient. Even in the face of catastrophic injury, healthy neurons can take over some of the responsibilities of damaged or dead cells. When an injured brain starts to build new networks of neurons, the process of recovery begins. To understand how the brain recovers, we need to study the behavior of its nerve cells. The brain houses roughly 100 billion nerve cells, and they reach out and connect with each other with their long, wiry fibers. By themselves, brain cells aren't too impressive, but when they hook up with each other, they become truly astonishing. Here, actual cells or neurons are building a circuit. One by one, neurons form connections with each other, creating vast chains of communication networks. The phenomenal quantity of connections, astounding in their intricacy and complexity, eventually number in the trillions. It's these connections that allow neuron-to-neuron -neuron communication, the basis of all brain activity. Neurons talk to each other in a two-step process, using electricity and chemistry. Electrical signals, traveling through each cell, send bursts of chemical molecules from one neuron to the next. These chemicals, called neurotransmitters, convey countless kinds of messages. The brain's neural networks extend through the rest of the nervous system in the body. This allows the body to feed the brain a constant stream of information about the surrounding environment. What the body picks up on its right side enters the left side of the brain. 
the left brain, also controls movement of the right side. Conversely, the right side of the brain controls movement on the left side of the body. Other sections of the brain are also delegated to certain tasks. This area covers vision. This strip handles touch. This one, movement. Speech comes from the areas shown in yellow and orange. Only the left side of the brain is equipped with the neural networks for language. If a stroke damages the left side of the brain, the patient may lose the ability to speak. A stroke like this could also paralyze the right side of the body. This is what happened to Kentaro's wife. Kentaro has been charting his wife's progress for nearly a decade now. Most stroke victims regain whatever functions their brains can restore within a year or two. But now, doctors realize that the brain can slowly improve for years afterward. Its neurons continuously rewire and remodel their networks based on what the brain encounters in the outside world. Consequently, the more stimulation the brain receives, the faster it can rewire itself. Doctors credit much of Toshko's improvement to the persistent attentions of her husband, who provides her with constant sensations. Still, Toshko's recovery is slow, due in part to her age, 69. <laughs> When we are younger, our brains are much more resilient. They can adapt and respond to incoming information from the environment with lightning speed. This special kindergarten in Osaka, Japan, shows the remarkable recovery rates for brain-damaged children. About a third of the youngsters here suffer neurological problems. The emphasis is placed on physical stimulation, finding ways to encourage the brain to interact as much as possible with the outside environment to stimulate its neural networks. The results are sometimes astonishing. This young boy, Shun-chan, was born with such severe brain damage, doctors did not expect him to live. This is an MRI image of Shun's brain. The only parts of his brain that function are highlighted in yellow. The dark cavity shows the extent of the damage. Areas normally dedicated to sight, hearing, and movement are missing. Even so, Shun can walk, see, and hear. The healthy parts of his brain, those neural networks that still function normally, have taken over those tasks. Dr. Kogure is a neurologist who specializes in brain restoration. He's been observing this process in the children at the kindergarten. This is a child no one expected would ever be able to see. If he had been seen by 50 doctors, all would probably have said he'd be bedridden and unable to see or hear. But the fact is, he can do these things. The part of his brain that was left intact 
has compensated to the extent that we now expect him to be able to be relatively independent in all sorts of daily life skills. The reason for Shunchan's miraculous recovery may lie here, in the oldest part of the brain, called the brainstem. Functioning like a main switch, the brainstem maintains all brain activity. Its axons spread throughout the entire brain. Excitation of the brainstem results in the transmission of electrical impulses which heighten brain activity. Therapists believe that repetitive exercises like crawling might stimulate the brainstem, thus improving the brain's recovery from trauma. Even before Shun entered this kindergarten, he had made remarkable progress, thanks to the efforts of his mother, who nurtured him constantly. When he was born, Shun was stiff and non-responsive. He didn't even cry. Soon after Shun's birth, his mother massaged him every day, all over his body, for long periods, calling his name. She shook his hands, encouraged him to touch objects that were hot or cold, exposed him to different colors and smells of flowers and foods. When Shun started to smile, his mother returned it and spoke to him. The constant care paid off, and when Shun was able to move on his own, his mother took him to this kindergarten. Shun continues to progress, a remarkable testament to the resiliency of the young brain. How is it that a child's brain recovers faster than an adult's? Part of the answer lies with the fact that a child's brain is much more elastic. This microscopic footage shows young neurons on the left and older ones on the right. Both of the neural branches are cut at the same time. Notice the speed with which the young ones reconnect on the left side. The young brain's ability to rewire itself quickly plays a key role in rehabilitation. Across the world, there are similar success stories of brain restoration among the young. One comes from Georgia. Throughout his young life, 10-year-old Jonathan Wilbanks suffered from severe epilepsy. Doctors tried to treat it without success. Three years ago, as a last resort, surgeons removed the left half of Jonathan's brain to stop the life-threatening seizures. This MRI image shows how much of Jonathan's brain was actually taken out. After surgery, Jonathan could no longer speak. With his left brain missing, Jonathan couldn't move the right half of his body. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, I'll see you. Come on, look at the camera. 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 This is Jonathan today. Three years have passed since the operation. Much of his paralysis is gone. He can even grip with his right hand. 
Looking at this energetic 13-year-old in action, it's hard to imagine that the left half of his brain is missing. His right leg is fully functional, capable even of a few swift kicks. Though Jonathan still struggles with speech, the words are getting easier. The apple. Oh, this. Yeah. Okay. The apple is red. Okay. It. He still has yeah. difficulty, for example grouping nouns into their proper categories. Well, is it? It will take hard work, but Jonathan's prospects for a full recovery are extremely good. Here is a computer-enhanced brain image of a 35-year-old man who, as a boy, underwent the same surgery as Jonathan. He now lives a normal life. A PET scan of the brain, shown in colors, reveals that this patient's speech ability, normally handled by the brain's left side, has migrated to the right side, where it's handled by other neural networks. When the brain suffers injury, a number of biological events unfold that allow the organ to begin repairing itself. This is a microscopic picture of damaged brain tissue. The holes are created by special cleanup cells that clear away the debris of dead tissue. This process is carried out by macrophages, shown in blue, and astrocytes, highlighted in orange. Together, these cells pave the way for restoration. Here's what happens inside the brain. These are normal neurons with electric impulses traveling through them. After suffering damage, the blue neurons on the right are destroyed. The impulses are no longer transmitted. The first to arrive on the scene are the macrophages who consume the damaged tissue. When they finish clearing away the debris, they signal the astrocytes. The astrocytes help the cleanup by releasing vast amounts of a substance called nerve growth factor. Working like a biological fertilizer, nerve growth factor encourages neurons to sprout new branches that reach out and connect with other neurons. New lines of communication are set up to do what the damaged neurons once did. With the power lines restored, the brain regains some of its functions. Under the microscope, it's possible to see these housekeeping cells at work. These are actual macrophages, the brain's Pac-Men. When the brain is damaged, Macrophages increase in number and appetite. After the cells consume the damaged tissue, fluid collects in the empty spaces left behind. The neurons can then extend their branches into these spaces to rebuild networks. They're encouraged by these astrocytes, which, upon bursting, release nerve growth factor. Under microscope, it's possible to see nerve growth factor's dramatic effects. 
The substance was added to the neurons on the right. Axons are growing rapidly. Restoration of brain function begins with this new growth. Some researchers speculate that nerve growth factor helps account for the flexible wiring in the brain. A site like this, neurons sprouting fibers and establishing new connections, dismantles our previous notions about the brain's static and hardwired character. Still, when the brain suffers injury, full restoration of functions depends on more than a neuron's ability to grow new connections. Research shows that sometimes when the brain is rebuilding its damaged networks, the neural wires get crossed by mistake. At this hospital in Germany, a patient is recovering from a stroke that damaged the left side of her brain, leaving her right side paralyzed. Therapy helped her regain some movement. Viel besser. Die Sprache ist auch schon wesentlich besser geworden. Still, when she moves her right hand, notice that her left hand moves too. The neural wires that control movement in her right and left hands have crossed. The brain can correct this too by reinforcing and strengthening newly restored circuits. To see how, we need an inside view of how neural forests grow. Here, newly formed branches of neurons reach out and connect with this neuron in an attempt to restore certain functions. Before the injury, only one particular neuron fired off its signal to this one. But in this newly formed network, the cell is getting messages from many others no clear pathway or circuit has been set up. Consequently, the information is muddled and weak. The connecting neurons bombard the receiving neuron with neurotransmitters, chemical molecules that carry a variety of messages. What we have, understandably, is a confused network. The incoming red signals are the correct ones. Physical therapy can reinforce that particular circuit and give the network a much needed jolt to straighten itself. Now, the receiving neuron is starting to get a stronger, clearer signal from the red circuit, while other neurons continue to send their weak signals in blue. Eventually, the red circuit replaces the other connections, and the network undergoes a bit of neural pruning. The weak connections are weeded out as the strong one grows more firmly rooted. Through the constant reinforcement that physical therapy provides, the circuit is finally restored to its proper working order. <laughs> For Toshko, her long journey toward recovery began just a few months after her stroke, when she started to feel pain on the right side of her body. The neural networks that allow her to experience sensation were slowly reconstructed. <laughs> Now, 
She is trying to gain movement of her right side. Days like this remind Kentaro why he is here. But sometimes progress is frustratingly slow. Kentaro has devoted several years to trying to teach his wife to speak again. Her increasingly frequent bouts of resistance began to puzzle him. In his diaries, Kentaro expressed the feeling that Toshiko had entered a rebellious stage, that she was simply acting up the way an adolescent might. But Toshiko's refusal to cooperate intensified as time passed. Finally, Kentaro sought out someone who could explain his wife's behavior. Kentaro arranged a visit between his wife and Dr. Kogura, the same doctor who studies neurological restoration in children at the kindergarten in Osaka. Okay. Can you see this? What about this? How about over here? And how about over here? Mm. Now you can see. Are you feeling okay? How are you feeling? Mm. Toshiko is decidedly more cooperative with the doctor. She seems to save her frustration only for her husband. Later, Dr. Kogura advises Kentaro. I really admire the way you've devoted yourself to caring for your wife. But I think I know what's bothering her at the moment. From what I've observed, Toshiko uses a full range of facial expressions to show happiness, sadness, and anger. It would be a mistake to think of her as a child or adolescent. All of our experiences are stored as memories in various parts of the brain. Toshiko has lost certain parts of her memory, but she still has recollections dating back 40, even 60 years, so she's certainly not a child. The various sounds and movements she makes, they are words themselves. It's the way she can make herself understood using her right brain. If you make a new start with this in mind, she's certain to improve. Dr. Kogura advises Kentaro that his wife's so-called rebellion may be a healthy attempt to express herself. When Toshiko's stroke destroyed the left side of her brain, it also destroyed her speech center and her ability to communicate. Mm. 
みかんの花が咲いている。Toshiko was becoming more and more frustrated with Kentaro because he was trying to teach her things that require use of the left brain. Dr. Kogure encouraged Kentaro instead to appeal to her right brain through skills like singing. Toshiko's gestures and facial expressions while singing are her right brain's way of communicating. Toshiko's healthy right brain has tried to compensate for the left as best it can. In this PET scan image, the white, yellow, and red colors indicate high levels of brain activity. Whereas in a normal brain, the right side is not taxed to quite the same extent. Instead of using words, Toshiko uses different sounds to convey her thoughts. This is the vocabulary of the right brain. In healthy brains, the right and left sides work together to integrate words with proper intonations. The left brain produces the correct speech, and the right brain. Mediates the emotions attached to it. Hi, how are you? Words produced only with the left brain will be intelligible, but will sound flat or indifferent. Hi, how are you? Conversely, if only the right brain is involved, then the language will sound like gibberish, although the emotions accompanying them. Might be recognizable. Wow! Even though the sounds produced by the right brain aren't normal speech, they are filled with intent. The t t t sound that Toshiko makes means something. Kentaro needs to figure out what. In this case, she wants a potato chip. Body movements and hand gestures are also important elements of right brain communication. These gestures and their accompanying sounds allowed Toshiko to develop her own vocabulary. She uses about 30 signals, and each has a specific purpose. She is also successful at expressing a wide range of feelings. <laughs> Not all days are productive, though. Some days, the more Kentaro tries to engage his wife, the more she resists. Willpower wields tremendous influence over our ability to heal ourselves, 
though doctors are unsure how or why it works. Now, researchers think the answer might lie in the brainstem. The brainstem is our life support system. It controls heart rate and breathing. But within the brainstem sits a pea-sized area called the locus ceruleus. The locus ceruleus consists of a tight bundle of neurons. About 30,000 of them cluster in this tiny space. The influence of those neurons extends throughout the brain as their long fibers build looping pathways of communication. These neural streams interact with the areas of the brain that control motivation and attention. And when excited, the neurons of the locus ceruleus use their extended fibers to pump a chemical substance called noradrenaline into the neural system. The noradrenaline prompts the yellow astrocyte to release nerve growth factor and other similar chemicals that encourage regeneration. We can see noradrenaline's dramatic effects using this experiment. This rat is missing areas of his right brain. As a result, the left side of his body is paralyzed. The rat is unable to cross the wooden walkway. It then receives an injection of a drug that stimulates the release of noradrenaline. Three hours later, the paralysis disappears. Under a microscope, we can see noradrenaline strengthening neural activity. Here are neurons in a cat that normally respond to vision. When noradrenaline is added, the number of responding neurons rises dramatically. The results suggest that neural networks are somehow fortified or extended by noradrenaline. A picture of willpower and its effects on recovery might then look something like this a stimulated brainstem that channels streams of noradrenaline throughout the brain, activating the cells responsible for restoration. A patient's environment can deeply affect motivation. Victims of traumatic brain injury often show a powerful need to return to their familiar world, to regain pieces of a lost past. In his diaries, Kentaro wrote of revisiting favorite places with his wife. <laughs> Today will be a simple outing to the supermarket. But to his wife, Kentaro recalls shopping was always great fun. This is the store where Toshiko shopped before her stroke. Traveling the aisles and scanning the items on display, Toshiko appears remarkably attentive and stimulated. Yes, 
本当だまずよいっぱい溜まったなこれがいいなこれもいいなこれもいいなこれもいいなさて今度はどちらに行きますか As Toshiko's story illustrates, the brain can continue to recover from traumatic injury for as long as 10 years. Each case is different depending on motivation, therapy and normalizing activities. But the miracles that we hope for are still decades away. When they arrive, They may look like this. Researchers in Chicago are working on a brain coolant that could be injected into the carotid artery minutes after someone suffers a stroke or traumatic head injury. Starved for oxygen and blood, neurons only survive for about two minutes or less. When the neurons die, the damage is done. But clinical trials have proven that cooling the brain enables the cells to live for an hour or more. Scientists are also developing a brain cooling helmet. In the hands of paramedics, this kind of equipment could someday buy victims of brain injury the crucial time they need for treatment and make the difference between tragedy and triumph. Until that time, patients like Toshko must depend on the rehabilitation process, where success comes slower but is perhaps more poignant. The fall festival in Hanamaki, a time to pray for a bountiful harvest. This place harbors rich memories for both Toshko and Kentaro. In the old days, they attended the festival almost every year. In the tradition of their ancestors, the dancers celebrate a season of plenty. Opening the way to a new cycle of growth. For Toshko, these familiar rhythms are becoming increasingly resonant as old feelings stir inside her, and she discovers new ways to share them. <laughs> A recent entry in Kentaro's diary reads I have been trying my best to teach my wife, but I'm beginning to question now who is the student and who is the teacher? It's not always so clear anymore. For Toshiko and Kentaro, a new cycle of restoration and life is just beginning.
Discovery Channel and the Chrysler Corporation are proud to bring you the best in quality documentary television. This presentation of The Brain is presented in partnership with Chrysler Plymouth and Jeep Eagle, divisions of the Chrysler Corporation.